Um, so I'm Kathy Jacobs. I'm the director of the Center for Climate Adaptation, Science, and Solutions, and we would like to welcome welcome you to our our third set of TED talks on the issue of how social science um, can make methodological contributions to adaptation. Uh, this actually is a much broader topic than that. Um, what really has happened in each of these previous conversations is a lot of interdisciplinary conversation and actually some really specific research outcomes. So it isn't um, only because we, we think it's fun to have these conversations, though in fact um, we hope you think that too. And guess, uh, seeing how many of you are here, I'm guessing it's true you do. Um, but we are extremely uh, grateful to the people who have chosen to do this today. The way we are going to organize this is in alphabetical order, so um, you know nobody can blame us for um, not setting this up in some, some truly biased so social testing way. Um, we just did it alphabetically. Um, the idea is each one of them will give uh, a five-minute talk. We will hold off on the conversation until after all five of them have spoken. Then they'll uh, come down and uh, answer your questions and talk to each other as well. So be thinking as you're listening to all of these of good questions that you can ask um, of any one of the panel members. So unless there are uh, objections, and even if there are, I think I'll go forward and, and um, begin. So I'm going to introduce uh, George Friswold first. Um, he's a professor and extension specialist in agriculture and resource economics at the U of A. He has his bachelor's and doctoral degree from um, Berkeley, which I think is a very good place to get your graduate degree from because that's where I went to. Um, he, um, he has been a lecturer in geography and environmental engineering at the Johns Hopkins University and chief of USDA's resource policy branch. Um, he does a lot of work in ag economics and in climate. And take it away, George. Thank you, Kathy. Can you hear me all? OK. Um, so this is basically economic things that I do. This isn't definitely, this is definitely not you know, the only thing economists do, um, and it's also, it's some economics, it's also some tools, and as we'll hear from the other speakers, economics isn't uh, the only way to approach social issues, but some of the stuff I've done, glad to see Bonnie, one of my co-editors of this book, uh, Adaptation and Resilience, looking at climate change, and so one of the, a lot of the projects working in this book is doing regression analysis, looking at data, you know, how do farmers use information? What causes them to choose particular technologies? There's been a lot of initiatives looking at trying to provide more decision tools and more information for farmers. Uh, one of the things we've discovered is their actual use of it is incredibly low. So the question is, it, it, we don't necessarily have a fields of dreams situation. If you put things up on websites, farmers don't usually, don't necessarily use it, especially in the Four Corners region of the Southwest. Internet use, computer access is really low. Other things we've been looking at is, uh, again, multivariate regression, looking at climate, national park visitations. Uh, a lot of early studies suggested that when it got warmer, you would have more visits to national parks, but those studies tended to look at higher latitude areas. When you start looking at the southwest, the converse is the case. Again, one of the things we've been looking at lately is climate crop insurance and crop abandonment. A lot of work on the effects of climate extremes on agriculture have focused on yields. But in 2011, 60% of Texas's cotton crop was completely abandoned. And that doesn't count when people estimate yield per harvested acre, but that's a case where 60% of the acres where yields went all the way to zero. So most studies that look at yields often ignore abandonment, and that's one of the things we're looking at. And a lot of work on just how farmers use water, what they use it for, how productively they use it, how profitable it is. Um, Mostly in an earlier life, I did a lot of work on world trade, computable general equilibrium modeling of climate change. I actually directed um, others in doing a lot of the early USDA research on the impacts of climate change on world agriculture. And this computable general equilibrium models are models that have like the entire economy. And I worked with folks at Purdue University and USDA for this global 
the GTAP model, it's a global trade analysis model that basically is uh, multi-country, multi multi-commodity model where all the sectors and all the trade patterns are linked. And we use those to look at how climate change affects agriculture. I've also done some smaller multi-market trade models. Also looking at US ag sector models where you have multiple um, agricultural sectors. One of the things that most USDA models don't include are vegetables because they tend to focus on all the major commodity crops, corn, soybeans, wheat. They don't include veggies. A lot of USDA models also don't include water as an input. So we actually developed a model that explicitly includes water. And one of the things we were looking at is what's the effect of large water shortages in the West. We also um, used it to look at climate change mitigation policies. We were looking at cap and trade and cap and trade with agricultural domestic offsets. I want to talk to you about that at some point because we found one of the most interesting results from that study was that there's been a lot of concern about the dead zone, the hypoxia zone in uh, the Gulf of Mexico with a lot of fertilizer running through the whole Mississippi Valley and ending up in the Gulf. And one of the things the economists have said is that we should have fertilizer taxes and you should have land set-asides to reduce the hypoxia zone. If you look at what carbon offsets would do in the US, that would achieve that very same thing. So one of the things that carbon offsets might get you is these unintended, or basically unintended benefits of better water quality in dealing with the hypoxia zone. Uh, more recent work is looking at input-output models of water transfers in rural communities. So if water is moved out of particular rural areas, what does that do to the local economy? There's a lot of concern in potentially water exporting regions about that. One minute. Game theory. We've all seen a beautiful mind, I hope. So a lot of different applications. In game theory, people uh, don't act like the atomistic um, people in Econ 1 textbooks, people have a certain amount of market or political power, and so the idea is how do people act strategically? And some of the things I've looked at that is joint uh, water management, infrastructure investment in the U.S.-Mexico border, also in designing uh, environmental agreements, how can you make them sustainable and self-enforcing? Um, other issues having to do with rural urban water transfers, inv invasive species control, herbicide resistant weeds, how do you overcome certain tragedy, the commons issues, climate, um, protecting against climate change is a kind of global tragedy, the commons, but a lot of these apply to other issues as well. We're done? Done. <laughs> thank you, George. So um, I want to thank Mary while she's up here. She goes to great lengths to make sure that these events um, go so seamlessly. And we've done three events this week, so um, I actually owe her quite a number of bottles of wine. Um, anyway, uh, our, our next speaker is Laura Lopez Hoffman. She's an assistant professor in uh, School of Natural Resources. What? Associate, Associate sorry. My, my bad. Uh, it was it was uh, condensed to the point where I couldn't tell the difference. Um, anyway, she's an associate professor in, so in the School of Natural Resources uh, and also is affiliated um, with the Udall Center for Studies in Public Policy. Um, she has a PhD from Stanford, a BA from Princeton, um, has done, done work as a tropical ecologist um, and is now working on research that contributes to the development of environmental policies and institutions that protect ecosystems and human well-being and uses interdisciplinary and comparative research approaches. So we're looking forward to hearing from you. So this is working? So one of the approaches that's um, been promoted a lot, at least in my field, which is natural resources, for dealing with climate change and adapt adaptation to climate change is this idea of adaptive management. Um, adaptive management is a structured, iterative um, process uh, to support decision making in the face of uncertainty, and it relies on monitoring the system so that you can see what's happening, and if you notice that you've hit a certain point, um, then you um, change, change course a little bit. And so the idea is that system monitoring can reduce uncertainty and increase resilience over time. So about a year and a half ago, 
uh, a couple of colleagues of mine, one of whom is here, Trent Triggerstem up here in front, realized that we are very fortunate in this region to have a natural experiment. Adaptive management has been promoted a lot, but there are, are not a lot of studies to assess its efficacy. And so we realized that we have a natural experiment right here in the region where we can test adaptive management. Starting in 2007, the US Forest Service mandated that um, the permits, so the permits required uh, for grazing permits, needed to use an adaptive management approach. So it's a rolling process. Uh, when you get a grazing permit, you have about 10, 10, you have 10 years on it, and then you have to renew your, your permit. So starting in 2007, they began requiring that, that ranchers um, start using adaptive management approaches in how they were going to manage their grazing allotments on public land. So we now have um, kind of a, 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 a natural experiment of examples where people have been using adaptive management. They haven't been using because not everybody has upped the, the permit yet again. Is it 15 years or 10 years? Yeah, it's 10. So we have some that have been using it for longer and some that have been using it for shorter amounts of time. And we can test and see how adaptive management is working. And these, this is actually a big, it's kind of a big experiment for the US Forest, Ser or Forest Service to, to um, engage in um, because they don't really have a lot of information about whether or not it works. And yet they've applied it to 19 million acres here um, in Arizona and New Mexico. And that's 1.7 animal units. So the idea behind adaptive management is that um, as you undergo an ecosystem change, so in this case, in this graphic here, um, pr precipitation. So on the, there's a bottom axis, which is um, precipitation, it's decreasing. So the idea uh, is that as precipitation decreases, the rancher will slowly start to decrease the, the number of animals that he or she is grazing on the land. Um, and that when participation increases again, the land will be in good state. So here we've got kind of green grass. Um, and that they'll be able to put a higher number of cattle back on the land. And this would be in contrast to a system where as precipitation, precipitation decreases, um, the rancher does not change the number of cattle on that allotment. And then all of a sudden they have a kind of a degraded area, not a lot of grass, and they can't graze as many cattle. This sets up several hypotheses. Um, for us, which were, so if you look at the top on ranch A, um, our hypothesis is that um, after you go through the process of drought and then you come back at the other end, the ranches that had adaptive management will have more ecosystem services. That's an ecosystem service flower diagram. Um, we're going to be looking at forage production, beef production, plant biodiversity, and soil health. Um, and that um, they will um, have more money because they'll be having more revenues. So they'll be able to run more cattle. And then also, it's missing from this diagram, but we also hypothesize that there will be lower transaction costs for the rancher for having um, engaged in the NEPA process. And in contrast, the ranches without adaptive management will have fewer ecosystem services provided by their ranch lands, um, and that they'll have experienced a, data, a greater decline in their economic situation on the ranch. So in this example, um, we are looking in at sort of uh, several different metrics, not just social science metrics, but e also economic um, and ecological metrics. So for the economics, uh, the methods that we're using are we're, we're going to look at the cost of production of beef um, and also ranch budgets to see if indeed the ranch has more economic resiliency if their budgets change less over time. In terms of tr NEPA transaction costs, we're going to be asking the ranchers about how much it costs for them to produce their NEPA documentation, how long it took for them to get their documentation. At a macro level, we're going to be looking across the system to see if there's fewer lawsuits um, and people contesting the permits um, in, in, on ranches and allotments that used adaptive management. And then we're going to also be talking to both ranchers and managers to see if the relationship, if the perceived relationship um, with Forest Service has improved or not between allotments that have and don't have adaptive management. So our next speaker is Brian Meyer. Um, Brian is an associate professor in the School of Sociology um, and an affiliate with the Institute of the Environment and the School of Public Health. 
He has a BA in Environmental Studies and Politics from Santa Cruz and a Master's and PhD um, from Brown University. He focuses on the social production of environmental health risks in uh, the US, in U.S. society um, and has employed community-based participatory research methods in ways that assist community organizations to develop capacity. Um, he's also worked in blue-green coalitions, working with union workers and environmental groups. So take it away, Brian. Thanks, Kathy. Can everyone hear me? Is this on? Yeah. Okay, great. So um, I wanted to talk to you about one uh, methodology that uh, I am utilizing in a variety of different research projects around resiliency, adaptation, climate change, as well as disaster. Uh, I want to talk about network analysis. Uh, my goal is to give you enough terms to be somewhat dangerous uh, in terms of asking questions, uh, sort of inform you in the terminology and perhaps have a discussion about uh, what we're actually learning uh, in, uh, in the discussion panel. Um, so I want to make the case that, uh, that social networks or, or social capital as we measure networks as are the engine that drives adaptation and recovery. And we can find this consistently across any type of study that beyond socioeconomics, beyond demographics, beyond interventions, aids, other programs, communities that are, are connected, uh, sorry for that, uh, consistently recover more successfully and at quicker rates than communities that are less connected. And the challenge then is to measure what we mean by this idea of both individual and community cohesion. Uh, and that's where social networks come into play. Traditionally, I'm very much uh, of an ethnographer. I tend to rely on qualitative methods to explore some of these questions of connectivity, cohesiveness. But as I increasingly interact with more and more natural scientists uh, and others, uh, we're searching for more quantitative metrics that help make sense of some of these more sort of social phenomenon in ways that interact well with public health data, with ecological data, and so on and so forth. So let's talk about some of the terms that we use in social network analysis. There are generally two approaches to understanding a social network. The first one is with what we would call sociocentric data. This is otherwise known as whole network analysis. This is done oftentimes in boardrooms and organizations and requires you to know each and everyone in that network and then I can ask each and everyone in that network what they think and how they interact with each other. The problem with doing this out in the field, in the sort of so-called real world, is it's almost impossible to identify a whole network. And so as an alternative, we have something called an egocentric approach that produces individual level data where I can ask someone like Kathy, tell me about people in your network and you tell me something about people in your network and then I can come up with metrics for you. And I can go and do that with Mary and I can go and do that with Tracy and I can start to talk about individual variation. When we do that, the first thing that's required is to identify personal networks. So how is it that I elicit from Kathy who you know? There are a variety of ways of doing this. This is often called an ego generator uh, or an alter generator. Uh, I can ask, tell me someone that's named A, B, C, D. It gets complicated in like V, U, W, and X, Y, and Z, uh, but there's ways of controlling for that. Uh, you can also do position. Tell me the name of a lawyer. Tell me the name of a butcher. Tell me the name of someone. Uh, what we use is a resource generator. I say, give me the name of X number of people that can help you in the face of a disaster or uncertainty, and you give me those names. Uh, if you give me enough names, so I imagine, if I ask, I'm going to continue to pick on you. If you gave me 30 names, let's say that five of them are here in this room. Diana. Uh, and Diana says, I'll give you 30 names, and you may be five people that are common in between Kathy and Diana. I can start to generate a community network based on those overlays and talk about the density or the structure of that overlaid network. Here are a couple of measures that I would suggest are important, again, just sort of in being dangerous. One is transitivity. How long does it take me to cross the network? You might think about this in terms of risk communication or information flow. How does something move across a network? Homophily. Birds of a feather flock together. Do people that are clustered tend to look like each other? And is that a problem? Centrality. Who are key nodes in this network? Who are the decision makers? Who is talked to a lot? 
and density. Uh, how clustered are people? Are there structural ho holes? Uh, is there a group of people that's not sharing resources or information? You can calculate all of these things based on this egocentric analysis. So I just want to show you that they actually do matter, uh, that we are able to calculate these things in a way that tells us something interesting. In our oil spill context, we're interested in the receipt of aid, of formal support to help people recover. We might argue this is important for adaptation and resilience. And what we found is that some basic demographics, what you see here is gender uh, and business ownership matter on the far left. But as we start to look at heterogeneity, or the opposite of homophily, how different people's networks are, look at the difference in terms of the people getting aid. Uh, there's not really any change in order, but the gaps really open up. So male business owners that have very diverse networks were getting aid at much higher rates than other individuals. Without that network data, we would have missed something of that gap. So this is something that you can do too, and I'm happy to talk about it some more. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Boy, these are a bunch of highly timely people. Um, so Allison Meadow is our, our next TED Talker. Um, she is a staff scientist with, uh, with the Center for Climate Adaptation, Science, and Solutions, um, for which we are very grateful. Um, her research focuses on collaborative and transdisciplinary research in the fields of climate services and climate adaptation. She works directly with interdisciplinary research teams to understand the needs of climate information users including tribal and natural resources managers, emergency managers, cultural resources managers, and to deliver usable, usable climate science for decision making. She is a BA in Native Studies and Anthropologies, Anthropology from Trent University, a Master's in American Indian Studies from the U of A, um, an MS in Urban Planning from the U of A, and a PhD in Environmental Anthropology from the Resilience and Adaptation Program at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Uh, take it away, Allison. Thanks. Um, thanks, Brian, for this. Does this is this working? Yes. Okay. <laughs> thanks. Um, okay. So as Kathy said, I work in CCAS, so we can assume that all of this is in the context of climate services and climate adaptation. Um, I'm going to take this in a slightly different direction. Um, my my big picture question was how does research get us? where we want to go. Um, research, as everyone has just been discussing, it promises us so many things, new insights, new understandings of the world, better living through chemistry. Um, I've always been really drawn to the applied side of research, this question of the potential for research to be useful and used by people, to enrich our lives, sometimes tangibly improve our lives. Um, and it wasn't really until I got here to U of A that I really began to engage in this question of how research can do this, how we as a community of researchers can engage with the broader communities of the world to make sure this happens. Um, I'm going to give you a brief tour of how I got here, um, some of the paths I followed and some of the tools that I've kind of picked up along the way. So as Kathy said, undergrad, um, I started at university as an anthropology major. Um, I've always found myself much more comfortable with the branches of anthropology that concern themselves with problem solving. Um, and I've found the tools of anthropology incredibly powerful in this realm. Um, and I've just listed them, you can read them. Um, how to conduct a good interview, construct those questions and conduct that interview in a way that allows the experiences of the participant to rise to the surface without our preconceived notions as researchers getting in the way of those experiences, that's a skill and it's incredibly powerful. Um, how to observe through participant observation a situation or a new event, what to look for, how to watch what's going on, and how to reflect and interpret what you're seeing, again, without your uh, preconceived notions getting in the way of that. Um, these are things that can really help us understand the world and the people that we're working with. Um, I was really fortunate to um, also go to a university that had a stellar Native Studies program. Um, that's where I was introduced to this whole other world of research, um, so I ended up double majoring. Um, in this world, research, as long as it was community-based, collaborative, and action-oriented, was really seen as a, so, as a, as a force for social change. Um, we called it action research. It goes by other names, collaborative and participatory research. Um, 
This kind of research acknowledges the agency of communities, whether they have been formally trained in research or not, to both undertake research and to affect the social, social change that they are seeking. Um, action research is inherently collaborative and participatory, and the goal is action and change. The tools are really similar to sort of traditional anthropology and social science methods, interviews, participant observation, except now we're adding facilitation of the process. You'll probably need to teach other people research methods, so you better know how to do that well. And I can't stress this enough, listening <laughs> in these contexts, sitting, taking a back seat, and being okay with that. Um, my background in action research introduced me to a subfield of action research that's really focused on organizational change, often um, highlighted by William Foote White. Um, and this asks the questions of how do we understand and change these organizations, whether that's workplace, whether these are social organizations that so dominate our lives. Um, how do we learn about those organizations and make changes that make them more functional, more fair, more progressive? So I followed that path. That also led me to uh, some interesting work in information science that looks very carefully at how organizations and individuals seek out and use information to solve their specific problems. Um, there's something called an information use environment that looks carefully at the requirements, the norms, and expectations of organizations that determine how or whether new information has been sought. Um, this has become really important in the work that I've been doing with climate information, particularly this very highly technical climate information that we are often dealing with in these contexts. So that brings me to uh, both a destination and another point of departure, this idea of evaluation and evaluation research. Um, I actually sort of think of this as adaptive management for people. <laughs> um, if we want to use these approaches and these tools that I've described to improve the world, we really need to understand how and under what conditions they do that. So how do we get better at these research approaches and at engaging with communities and collaborating with diverse uh, groups? Um, we need to evaluate our practice, we need to share our lessons learned, and we, then we can move the whole field forward. So I think of evaluation as the tool to reflect and learn. Um, it provides a systematic way to examine our work, our successes, and our challenges. And it helps us understand our known world a little better and act as a compass to keep us pointed towards our ultimate goals. Thank you very much, Allison. So our, our final uh, TED Talker is Tracy Osborne, um, who is, an, I believe, an assistant professor in geography. Did I get that one right? Okay, good. Um, she has her PhD from Berkeley. Uh, and she conducts research on the social and political econ and economic dimensions of climate change mitigation, particularly in forest ecosystems of Latin America. More recently, she's been working collaboratively on a mapping project about, uh, about unburnable carbon across the Americas. She founded and directs the public policy, uh, sorry, the public political ecology lab, an innovative project of engaged scholarship that aims to communicate environmental research to the broader public as a vehicle for social and environmental justice. Go for it, Tracy. Thank you, Kathy. So it's uh, an absolute pleasure for me to be here um, to present some of my new work on, on unburnable carbon and also to reflect on political ecology as a framework for climate change research. So political ecology is an interdisciplinary social science field that combines the concerns of ecology with um, a, a broadly defined political economy. Political ecology re research is empirical. It pays attention to history, to geography, and ethics with um, consideration of power relations across multiple scales. So what distinguishes political ecology from other cognate fields is that it focuses on the causes of environmental problems as opposed to the symptoms. It stresses that ecological systems are political and our understandings of these systems are mediated by political and economic processes. So in other words, it recognizes that environmental problems are not simply biophysical processes, 
but that are shaped by social and political economic forces, often within the context of highly unequal power relations. And finally, it's normative in, in the sense that it recognizes, to quote Paul Robbins, that there are very likely better, less coercive, less exploi exploitative, and more sustainable ways of doing things. So uh, my more, most recent project uh, provides an example of political ecology in action. The Climate Alliance Mapping Project is a collaborative project um, between a number of faculty and uh, graduate students here at the U of A with a number of environmental and indigenous organizations that are working across the Americas to identify priority areas for keeping fossil fuels underground. It starts with the premise that we have already used 65% of our carbon budget, and in order to stabilize climate at the two degree target, we have to keep a significant amount of fossil fuels unburned or, or left underground. The International Energy Agency has argued that up to two thirds of all fossil fuels in proven reserves must remain unburned or left underground in order to stabilize climate at the two degree mark. Uh, an article that came out in Nature in 2015 by McGlade and Eakins um, argues that, you know, recognizing that the, the need to keep fossil fuels underground uses an economic calculus, an economic model and calculus to argue that those places should be it, it, those places where the cost of production are highest. But based on the work that we've been doing in collaboration with environmental and indigenous organizations, we use a very different uh, criteria and set of values, recognizing that um, socially, that, rather that um, ecologically and um, culturally important areas are, are the, the priority areas for unburnable carbon. So therefore we've been creating a map and the idea is to create a map of the Americas that identify these priority areas. We're using a Google Earth platform with four layers of information, um, the fossil fuel reserves, uh, protected or conservation areas that represents ecologically important zones, indigenous territory which, rec which um, it recognizes culturally important zones, and finally a digital storytelling component which allows for individuals and communities from the Arctic to the Amazon to communicate and share their experiences with fossil fuel development. So we've completed a map of the Amazon and this sort of represents the, you know, the fossil fuel reserves um, in, in red proposed an existing development of, uh, of fossil fuel development and you'll see that much of that development is taking place in the western Amazon, mostly in Ecuador and Peru. We've also identified the priority zones, indigenous territories and conservation areas. And because so much of the Amazon is represented by these priority zones, um, much of it, is, it, based on this criteria, would be considered um, uh, a prior priority for, or for keeping fossil fuels underground. So this project, I would argue, is uh, an example of political ecology because it focuses on the main driver of climate change namely the burning of fossil fuels. It also pays attention to political economy and power relations, but it's also normative in its claim that priority areas for keeping fossil fuels underground should not simply be based on economic calculus, but should also take into consideration ecological, social, and cultural values, the values that our environmental NGO and indigenous partners have expressed as critically important. A web portal based on this, this work will be launched in about uh, two to three weeks where you can learn more about the project. Thank you very much. Great, so I'd like to invite all of you uh, up to the front here to answer questions. I thought that was a spectacular performance um, on the part of all. Um, very, very impressive. Makes me want to go do work with all of them, which is one of the reasons we do this. Um, and it has had that effect with a few of the people that we've um, included in this, um, in this kind of set up before. So uh, I'm wanting to know if anybody has a question for any of these people or if any of you um, have a question that you want to ask each other. Do you want to start there? Is there anything uh, in terms of uh, questions between you before I open it up to everybody else? Or you're all, you're all mind numb from, from going through such stress? Um, okay, well, we'll open it up for all of you and see um, if you have some questions about... Go ahead, Laura. Sure. 
So I had a question about George about game theory. So you said that game theory helps in cases, well, you prefaced your introduction to game theory saying um, that uh, humans don't behave in the very rational way that 101 economics classes would like you to um, think, and so that game theory helps you understand that, and I wondered if you could expand on that a little. Sure. I mean, in, in, peop in real life, people aren't just atomistic agents. They're groups. People can exert power over each other. Um, you know, I mean, it relates to you know, some of the issues you're talking about. How you know how do groups combine? How do networks form? How do you make it cohesion? How, you know, how do you actually form cohesion? And so, um, it one of the things that lends you know to analysis is that social relations aren't just individuals. There's groups, and they form coalitions, and that people do not have equal power. And so. One of the things that game theory shows you, I mean, one of the, the, the first things it looked at were things like monopoly and perfect competition. And so you realize that, well, the market solution isn't always the right solution, um, and that power relationships matter. And so you can actually see and model in these relationships how you know, certain people could take advantage of their power in a situation. Um, and another thing it shows you is that unequal market exchanges don't you know, create problems. So just because there's an exchange going on doesn't necessarily mean you know, it's great for everybody. And so you have to actually pay attention to those kinds of you know, relationships and those outcomes. So one of the things it does is that there are good things about market exchange, but there's also what I call the dark side and that game theory actually helps you know, people get a handle on that and to quantify that. Great. Uh, any of the rest of you have any follow-up questions before we open it up? Nope. Okay, so anyone in the audience have a question about anything that they said or the use of any of these tools? Anybody? Yes. Go ahead. For Brian. And please identify yourself too. My name is Adriana Zuniga. I'm a, I am a postdoc at the Udall Center. And I did my dissertation on neighborhood design. And one of my variables that I studied was social cohesion, both from the design perspective. And I was wondering if you look at design in your study. Uh, not so much design. Uh, one of the things that we've been trying to experiment with is. Uh, broader indicators um, of vulnerability and resilience. And so uh, there's one that I like called a community resilience index. Um, and for, essentially it's designed by Kathleen Sharib and Fran Norris and, and a bunch of others. And they try and articulate that resilience is really a function of the combination of economics and social capital. Uh, but to measure social capital, they're very much dependent on, on proxies, these sort of neighborhood attributes, the number of churches. Uh, voting behaviors and things like this, um, which I think do a decent job at a macro level, maybe above a neighborhood, but doesn't necessarily really tell me a lot about individual agency and, and action uh, on, on the ground. And so what we've found, um, we have a number of different field sites, is that it's actually not a very good overlap between these macro indicators and the more sort of community-based network metrics that we come up through this egocentric analysis. And we're actually working on a paper right now trying to articulate the need for more individual level data that is sort of uh, algamated up uh, as opposed to these macro ones that you sort of have this ecological fallacy on the way down. So I'm not answering your question directly, um, but I think that you can measure them both, and it's really sort of up to you to figure out what's really capturing the phenomenon that you're trying to get at. For us, it's much more at sort of the individual level agency uh, approach. Great. Is another one? Uh, yeah, this, this question is for uh, Allison. Um, uh, my name is Albert. I'm a master's student in the development practice program here in the School of Geography. Uh, and, and most of my work is looking at evaluation and kind of uh, how evaluations are conducted. And uh, my work has been in Haiti and we've tried to create kind of this 
internal process, um, what we call collective evaluation. And I'm wondering if you're seeing a push for that in the literature um, where you have, instead of an external agent coming in to conduct evaluation, like an audit, um, you have more of a, uh, an internal process of negotiation for it. Yeah, um, I, I think absolutely. I am, um, I am seeing more of that. Um, I think, um, you know, the reason that I put that little cartoon up is that so many people do see evaluation as that external, I'm going to come in and tell you what you're doing right and what you're doing wrong, rather than seeing it as a tool for learning, which is where it really is powerful. Um, we're all constrained, of course, by the fact that you know we we are expected to report back on return of, for investment and and you know those kinds of external metrics, but I think that it is at its most powerful when you can do what you're talking about collective evaluation. Um, I can um, I recommend the um, International Development and Research Canada has this great um, outcome mapping process that it's exactly that it's a process where the um, where you ask people within the community to, you know, to jointly come up with what do you think are appropriate outcome metrics for this program. It's not a, it's, you know, you don't want to um, ignore what the funders want you to report back on, but you do want to take the opportunity to also develop your own internal process and outcome metrics to say, we think this is how we're going to track our progress. These are, these are um, appropriate metrics for us in addition to what we have to, to do both. So there's an opportunity for both. Um, and I think you're, you're right on that that's, that's the newer wave of progress. <laughs> Great. Um, other questions? Somebody else must have a question. OK. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is America Lutz. Uh, I am a PhD candidate in Arid Lands Resource Sciences, and my question is for Professor Fresbold. You mentioned in simulation modeling that models in agricultural sector are usually dry. Uh, I mean, there is no consideration or a broad consideration of water. Or I think I understood something like that, yeah, right? No, like, you're uh, like, how could that be? Uh, yes, exactly. No, my my question is because I am conducting a, a literature review for my own dissertation in Northwest Mexico, in agricultural areas in Northwest Mexico, and I have found that water policy is also not considered in these studies and adaptation to climate change. So my question is, why is that? Why we consider land separated from water, agriculture separated from water? I mean, that is crazy in the US Southwest, right? Um, yes. The, and I what guess, is that? I mean, one of the reasons is that uh, a lot of the focus of like big USDA, you know, ag sector models is they're looking at things like corn, soybeans, wheat, where a lot of it's dry land agriculture. Um, and so, again, if you've worked in Washington, D.C., you start, you realize that kind of west of the Mississippi, it, it kind of falls off people's radar screen. They don't pay that much attention to it. So, um, you know, in those kind of modeling, you, that they they don't account for it now. If you go to things like going on at the state level in California, um, you know, uh, there's there's a lot of work, you know, integrating water and agriculture, um, and actually some folks at UC Davis have done some things like linking ag and water for Mexico. Um, so if you want to talk about that, so maybe more that more way. local studies, not like the national. No, not level. yeah. I mean, kind of more uh, like in the Mexicali va uh, Valley in the Delta. I think there's a few other explanations for why it's not incorporated, but I bet somebody else in this panel might want to respond to that question too. Anyone else want to respond? Well, my answer is that institutional complexity is more than most researchers want to deal with. Um, so it's much easier not to talk about institutions. But anyway, um, other questions? Mr. Beiser. Thank you. Yeah, Jim Beiser from the School of Natural Resources and the Institute of the Environment. Um, I work a lot on climate services, that is moving from uh, the research world to action and decision making so that uh, and uh, providing, producing and providing information so it's useful and we can demonstrate that. 
It, one of the challenges is going from research to operations. Uh, that challenge has been met fairly well in the physical sciences. The question is, how do we move social science so it can become operationalized at the time scales that people are using information? For anyone that wants to answer that. So I'll just respond in, in regards to the network stuff that I, I presented. Um, but one thing that we like to articulate with the network research is if we're thinking about disaster preparation or, or adaptation, how does information flow, uh, whether or not it's within sort of formal institutions or informally across communities, and are there sectors, uh, you were talking about folks that aren't using the internet, so where are they getting their information from? It's through word of mouth, right? more or less. Uh, and the question is, can we map that community and understand where information is flowing freely, where information might be constrained, produce that map, give it to that community then and say, look, you know, there are folks that are being excluded when it comes to information flows, or is it resource sharing in the event of disasters? So if you want to do some type of intervention to make your community more resilient, do you need to sort of make ties with this group, that group, or this group? Uh, so we produce these maps uh, and we say, here's what's going on, here's what we think is your community might look like, uh, how can we help you address those, those gaps, if you will. So that's one way. Anyone else? So, um, <clears throat> I mean, just sort of speaking to um, this project, I mean, it was, you know, uh, based on conversations with uh, a number of environmental organizations. And, I mean, in a lot of ways, this information is just a, a, a you know, it's collating information that's already out, out there. Um, in terms of how to make this information accessible in a timely manner and it, so that it, it's actually useful for some of these some of the various organizations who are interested in unburnable carbon I mean that's one of the reasons that we're building this web portal you know uh, there de certainly are going to be articles that we we um, write based on the, the this work that are going to be in a number of, of geography journals and mainly geography journals but I think having a sort of a platform that is more accessible. Also, I think, you know, being able to work more collaboratively with um, folks who do who have GIS skills, I think is also really useful. I mean, Brian, your comment about working with natural scientists. So the idea of sort of using political ecology as a framework, but also integrating um, both the social and natural sciences and also using these, these platforms that um, are outside of a purely um, sort of academic arena. Anyone else on that one? Yeah. yeah. I think I'm going to reject the premise of your question, Jim. Um, I actually think that social science has an incredibly long history of being um, used and applied rapidly um, and, and very effectively um, in terms of social change, in terms of many of the issues that we're dealing with. Um, where I think we might have the gap right now is in the natural and physical scientists recognizing that history and recognizing the tools and making the links to, uh, to use those tools more effectively to, to make that leap from research to operations. Um, I, you know, I think when you, and probably all of us can speak to that, you know, when you really look at, um, at the history of, particularly of specifically applied social science, um, we've been doing this a long time. We have a lot to contribute. Um, and, but I do think we have a long way to go in terms of making that link and taking new information, these things like how the heck do you communicate what a global climate model means to a community? How do you draw from our tools and make that connection? Um, and so I, I think that's maybe the next challenge, and that's certainly, that's certainly what I'm interested in working on. <laughs> I think George is And, you know, I think a challenge is understanding how people use information and whether they use information. So, for example, in the U.S., one-third of farmers do not use computers for their business. More than one-third have no access to the Internet. So if you're doing climate services that are all web-based, there's a huge swath of, and this isn't developing countries, this is in the U.S., these are people you simply are not reaching. Now, the question is, 
where are they getting this information? And the work I've done looking at irrigation is that probably one of the major sources that smaller farmers use is their neighboring farmers. So you get these pathways where the larger folks are access, accessing various public sources of information, the larger folks are accessing private consulting services, and the small folks are basically trying to copy um, the big guys. Or they're, or they're not using scientific information. So I think one thing, there's a premise that you know, this kind of field of dreams, if we just put something up on a website, we have these internet tools, people are gonna use it, but you're assuming that the people have a computer and a lot more people don't use them than you would think in the US. Um, one of the things you know, with economics is we'll look at, are people using information, are people using technologies? And economy, we can develop economic models. And the good news is that economic theory usually has the variables that economists think matter, matter in the way they matter. How much of decisions do you actually predict well? It's really humbling how little that is. And that's why other kinds of approaches are really important because we don't, you need someone on another phase to go, instead of just saying, I have an economic theory about how people behave, actually ask them why. Because if you actually ask them why, you learn something. When I went, I was doing field work for my dissertation in India, and, and development economists had all these different theories about farm labor structure and things like that, and I started interviewing villagers. Why do you, I just asked them, why do you do this? Nothing matched the theory at all. So it's like, okay, scrap that. What really is going on? And so, um, you know, again, other approaches are really important, but just, you know, listening is really important and just asking people, why do you do what you do is, is, is very underrated. George, uh, how many of those people who don't have computers have smartphones? Probably a fair number of them have smartphones, but you're not going to probably be doing your farm budget on a but smartphone. But you might use an app of some kind, yeah. Yeah, but they're not using apps. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Bob, Mary? Bob. Hi, Bob Verity from the Udall Center. Is it on? I. Yeah, it's on. Great. Uh, I'm, I'm struck by one thing. If, if you guys were five physical scientists talking about your methodologies, I'm convinced that the first thing I would have heard was bemoaning the lack of data and the need for sophisticated instrumentation to get that data. Because I always hear that when I hear physical scientists talking. You guys hardly said anything about the the difficulty of obtaining reliable, timely uh, sets of data to do the kinds of things that you're doing. And obviously, that's a major constraint for social science research. So if you could say something about that. Anyone want to take that? Go for it, Laura. So I'll take that a little bit. I, I need to just clarify, I'm a natural scientist, but I was very uh, fortunate and, and feel very honored to be included here. Um, and the topic that I am uh, working on, I'm very interested in, is, is the National Environmental Policy Act. And actually, um, it, it, it's been called the Environmental Magna Carta of the United States. It's, it's our most powerful, most arguably our most important in environmental policy in the US, and there is a shocking lack of data on it um, because, uh, so for those of you who aren't familiar with it, it outlines a process, it's a procedural law, it outlines a process by which the government needs to inform people about actions that they're going to take on government property, government land, or um, stakeholders, citizens, any project that uses government money needs to um, go through this NEPA process whereby the government informs what's going to happen and then citizens have the right to um, comment on that. Um, there is no single repository of NEPA data. There is no, um, there's no single repository. I mean, a lot of people would think that NEPA documentation would be in the Library of Congress. It isn't. So, I mean, I didn't highlight that, but one of the things that's most exciting about our project is it's actually one of the few examples of where the NEPA process and the outcomes, both social and natural and 
ecological, physical outcomes are going to be assessed in a quantitative manner. Um, so it, you know, it, I'm just stunned. One of the reasons I'm fascinated by it as a natural scientist is I couldn't believe that such an important law had actually no data on it, or very little. Yes. <laughs> um, let me give you an example. Um, but I think it sounds like most of us are, are primary data uh, gatherers, and, and so this is sort of a struggle I, I, it sounds like all of us uh, think about. Uh, BP spilled a whole bunch of oil in the Gulf about six years ago, right? Fair enough. And um, part of their fines from the Clean Water Act, around the same time as NEPA came out, uh, are going to the National Academies. About $50 million is going to be spent over 30 years to understand the social ecological resilience of the Gulf of Mexico. And a fair chunk of my time has been spent going to these meetings and workshops advocating for the need for more regular social science data collection. Uh, absolutely, in the context of disaster, we have zero baseline data in, in almost every setting, right? Whether or not it's demographic data, uh, health data, uh, it's very challenging. And so I've actually been very inspired by the National Academy's approach to thinking about how they're going to spend this endowment uh, in that it's not all going to be ecological monitoring of sort of the, the viability of the Gulf, um, that there is going to be public health data collected on a regular basis. There is going to be social science data uh, collected on a regular basis. So there are opportunities, and uh, I took it upon myself today to talk more sort of positively about the things that we can do. Yeah, of course, there are huge gaps, but uh, in my field, I've been pretty optimistic about uh, opportunities to, to collect things like that. Um, you're right. One of the, I can think of two challenges that, that I faced um, in the last couple of years. One is, yeah, it, uh, among other things, it takes a long time to collect this data and take some energy. You know, interviews take a long time. You've got to transcribe them. You've got to code them. These things just take time, which takes, it's not, it's not computer, computing power and technological power. It's somebody on the other end of that information who's got to sit there and it's me or it's a research assistant and that, you know, that's so um, it's starting to get uh, funders, particularly funders who maybe are coming from natural and physical scientists, sciences, to recognize that um, our biggest investment is in person power um, and just number of hours spent collecting this data. Um, another interesting challenge that I faced is um, as uh, as federal agencies want to um, to collect and, and archive data that's coming out of these projects, they're not set up for dealing with social science data. So we get these sort of big, you know, we, we've got to archive this, we've got to make it publicly available, and I keep saying, you guys aren't set up for it. Also, you know, I collect social science data, and whether or not it meets those definitions of human subjects research as defined by the federal government or not, as a, you know, my research ethics dictate that I'm not handing over data, I'm not handing over transcripts to anybody. Um, they are for me, they're for my research team, and I, um, I take great pains to make sure that they're not um, seen or used out of context. Um, and, you know, that's just, that, that's just coming from my ethical position. I see Tracy nodding, so I think she probably agrees. So that's a challenge, again, in communicating um, across disciplines to be able to say, um, this, this is different kind of data. I want to be as transparent as possible, but we have to have um, new ways of thinking about archiving and sharing this kind of information. Yeah, I just wanted to um, to add the um, uh, Allison's point about um, the funding. I think is really key. I mean, if you, we think about the amount, even just through through NSF, the amount of of funds allocated for social sciences is significantly less compared to the natural sciences, and I think that makes a huge difference in terms of the scale of the projects that we're able to to implement. I think also um, there's the, the in, in many of the the social science teams tend to be smaller. You know, we pay attention to place, to geography, where it, it you know where it's it's not it's not as easy or in, in some cases um, appropriate to compare what might be happening in you know sort of the the southwest with 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 what's going on in the amazon and so it's very it's often very place specific we have these very close relationships with our partners where it, due to irb requirements it's not necessarily easy to sort of share that data more more broadly um, but i i do think that um, 
there's a, a, a need for you know working more collaboratively, collaboratively um, among social sciences, being able to sort of look at some of these large large scale questions that oftentimes natural sciences scientists are looking at, and even um, interdisciplinary work with with our natural science colleagues, but ones in which you know the social science is equally is considered a, a, equally you know in terms of if, what it brings to the project as are, as the natural sciences um, but I, I definitely have hope that that and I think certainly within the U of A there's there's um, room for that we've got a question in the back or yeah, sorry one, go one ahead one yep thing that's been happening with a lot of economic data and social data is there's been pushes in Congress to eliminate the data collection. So there's like, for example, a lot of USDA data that was like use of biotechnology, pesticide use, production practices that used to be collected every year. Now it's collected every five years. So it means that there's some phenomena you, you're not going to find out what's going on until very, very late. And that's, there's been a disturbing trend to, to continually defund uh, social data collection uh, from federal agencies because you know, Congress is, keeps pushing that and that just makes it harder you know, to figure, what's figure out what's going on. It's not just data collection, it's research overall. Yeah. Um, in the back. Yeah, my, hello, my name is uh, Michael Johnson. I'm a PhD candidate in American Indian Studies. I'm also a Hopi farmer uh, up on Hopi Reservation. And I think, you know, we have all this, you know, the importance of data and all this stuff is, you know, we're always, seems, it seems like scientists are always trying to get more data to come up with more stuff. But at Hopi, I would just sort of like to see scientists use what we already have and reinforce what we have and, and how it works, especially with our agricultural system. I mean, we're able to grow corn with no water, you know, no, I mean, basically no irrigation, not no water rainfall, we use that. And, you know, we have uh, a plethora of conservation techniques. You know, they're traditional in aspect, and some people call them primitive, but they work. You know, and it's just, it's just that we need help in order to validate those practices, even though we shouldn't, even though we know we need to, even though they know we, we so we need help to validate those practices in the science communities that would say, hey, look, our conservation practices are just as good as what, what the Western conservation practices and what they try to make us adapt. I mean, for example, when, when, um, when uh, we deal with things like, um, like, um, uh, let's say, soil erosion and stuff like that, we have our own systems and our own ways of doing that, using natural vegetation to deal with those things. But yet, you know, you'll have NRCS, which is a, a government agency I used to work for, coming wanted me to come in and put a plastic barrier up in the middle of a field. And I think uh, they're crazy, you know. I mean, our t we've been doing this for thousands of years. And so our, our help, and I don't know what, how much each of you work with, like, indigenous people in, in their knowledge, but I think our knowledge is just as valuable as what we learn here in, in our educational systems. It's just that we need help proving that, they're, that they meet your standards, which I don't think has to, we should have to do. But unfortunately, we have to do that if we want to have uh, funding in, in, order to, in order to continue to do what we're doing. I don't know if I'm making any sense, but that's just kind of my, kind of my question that, I, that I'd like to talk, have someone answer down there. Thanks for your question. So, I I mainly work. Um, I've I've for my dissertation work. I've worked in um, southern Mexico with indigenous communities um, around uh, climate change mitigation in forests. So so car the carbon offsets, and it was you know based one of the most interesting. Um, uh, outcomes or results from my dissertation really came from those conversations with uh, with with indigenous peoples who were were farmers, and you know, basically one one of them suggested that you know what they ideally would have pref preferred you know to the existing carbon projects where they were paid to plant timber species was to extend the life of their fallow systems. They would plant milpa, plant, plant corn, um, you know, and harvest for a few years and then leave the land fallow for up to 20 years in some, of the, in some cases. Whereas with the carbon, existing pro carbon project, after 25 years, they would cut the timber and use, use it. So they were very interested in getting support for a longer fallow system. We ended up working with a natural scientist, an ecologist in, in Mexico, in Chiapas, Mexico, to measure the carbon in both of those systems. And it was super interesting to see the significant amount amounts of carbon in the existing fallow. And so I think your 
right that there are some practices around climate change mitigation, adaptation that where you know l l learning from from people in the field, indigenous communities, um, uh, others in the field who have these pra these successful practices, and thinking about how we can um, bring Western Western science and indigenous knowledge or sort of local knowledge together in a way that that in, in then in off it often can validate some of those practices um, and you know, uh, it's, I, I mean, I, I have found it to be tremendously helpful for me in thinking about um, my own work. And, um, and I, I think there's a lot of, there's certainly a lot of uh, folks here who also are, are doing that type of work. Yeah, um, hi, Michael. I, in, in mine, sort of buried in there, um, you may have caught it, was reference to a paper about Hopi and drought, um, where we used some of the things that that I just talked about, um, some of that sort of thinking of research as a, as a tool to support community decisions. Um, and so this was a collaboration with the Hopi Department of Natural Resources to, to look at drought monitoring, um, to say exactly to your point, what, what is local knowledge about this? What are the local resources and how can we as outsiders not drive those decisions, not tell anybody how to do it, just come in as a support to say, hey, how can we take what's already going on here and just, just help harness that in a way that makes community decision making a little easier. Um, and so, I, you know, that again, kind of going back to the theme of my, you know, what I was talking about, that's what I think is, is sort of the power of research when applied um, appropriately to communities is to say, what are your concerns? What, what can we come in and, and help with? not tell, not direct, what is it that we can maybe help support community decisions and community change and community planning. So, uh, which is all to say, um, I agree. Um, and I don't think that Dan is here, um, but he, I, and I think you've talked with him about that project, so he could talk a lot more about that, Dan Ferguson, but I don't see him here. <laughs> I just wanna quickly say that that's exactly something that I'm struggling with right now. Uh, a number of us in the School of Public Health have a recent project called the Center for Indigenous Environmental Health Research, and I'm part of a team on Hopi right now uh, looking at indoor air quality and asthma. Um, so as you know, childhood rates of asthma look like they're going up. Uh, we were asked to go into folks' homes, do some particulate matter sampling inside the home, look at housing construction, traditional, other mobile, uh, and then come to conclusions. and. We're probably in a year now where we're trying to figure out, um, well, so what? So if we go in and we say, your traditional home uh, with your stove is producing bad air quality, you need to change. Uh, and, and that's not very powerful. That's not very sort of culturally appropriate or helpful. Um, and so we're trying to figure out if we're doing this research that we've been asked to help uh, uh, the Department of Health and Qu Environmental Quality do, how do we translate that? And I would say that the bulk of our research is going to be in sort of the, the translation and the outreach and making that research useful to the tribe uh, in such a way that isn't um, discriminatory or culturally inappropriate, uh, but does have some meaning. Uh, and for the folks in public health, that's, that's, that's very challenging because their immediate goal is to protect childhood health. Uh, and so we're spending most of our time thinking about how to answer that question. So I just wanted to say thank you for, for raising it. Any others? Are there, yes, there's one more. Hi, I'm Rachel Beagles. I am a graduate of the U of A from hydrology, and right now I'm working as an independent consultant. And I work with international NGOs in preparing proposals, in doing environmental assessments um, for mostly food security type projects, but my niche is kind of being the environmental consultant. Um, so I could ask all of you guys questions and monopolize this whole time. But um, I'm going to ask a question to Laura because I'm working on a project right now that um, is in a livestock um, rangeland type dominated area. And so I'm wondering when I go in, 
we of course have to, we want, we know that there are indigenous practices and that they have a method of monitoring their rangeland. And so I'm wondering, but I have to also mm -hmm. report back to the US government that our project is not damaging. It is actually helping the rangeland. So I have to create monitoring systems. So I'm wondering with your, your project that you're working on, is the adaptive management system in place? Is it showing results? Who's doing the monitoring? Is it the farm or the ranchers? Is it highly technical? Just a little bit more information. So the, okay, so this is on. So um, we're just starting this research. This summer is our first summer of research, so I can't answer that um, question to you. I can kind of clarify a little bit, but that, that the idea is that the rancher, in combination with the manager, the over the oversight from the U.S. Forest Service, um, develops the adaptive management plan, um, and so it, it's supposed to be kind of a collaborative process for how how to do it. Um, but I don't have any answers yet as to whether or not it's, you know, how it's working. And um, my sense is that there's not, I mean, other folks here can kind of chime in or correct me, and I can, I can introduce you to people who are in the audience that know this um, field very well, but that there probably isn't a lot of flexibility in there to uh, incorporate, like, local knowledge and indigenous knowledge in, in the monitoring program. Um, but there are other folks who know a lot more about that than I do. Great. Well, I think we're uh, nearing the, the end of torturing you all. Um, but I'd like to ask each of you a question um, and sort of the final salvo. Um, I'm interested in knowing what you think is the best path to truly interdisciplinary research. Um, because, you know, I think we think here at the U of A we're pretty good at this. Um, but my impression is that people like NSF don't even at an NSF have no idea what it means. Um, and so I'm wondering, it doesn't, I don't, you can start with whoever comes up with a good answer first. But, but uh, I think this is a huge, a grand challenge and wondering um, if any of you have any insights or experience in, uh, in how to make it happen in a good way. Allison's up first. I'm going to jump in first just because um, I was quite lucky to have done my PhD in an NSF IGRIT program. Um, this is an, in, uh, I always forget the acronym, Interdisciplinary Graduate Education Research and Training, funded by NSF to promote interdisciplinary studies. Um, and I agree with you, I'm still not sure that NSF knows exactly what that is. Um, but um, it takes more resources and more time than anybody thinks. Um, and, and we should stop shortchanging ourselves in that. Um, what I can tell you is that we spent my entire first year just, just trying to understand each other's language, um, sharing, what, what do you mean by that? And how do you do this? And oh, wait a second, we were on the completely different page just because we used that word in two different ways. Um, I mean, that took an entire year before we understood each other. Um, so I, I think, yeah, I think we're, we're always shortchanging um, that process of just getting to know each other. Um, and, um, and I think it's also incumbent upon us, the researchers, to check our egos at the door. Um, and, and just come in and, and saying, I, I have certain tools and experience and knowledge, and it is not the only way to see the world. And I, am, I, I do not have a monopoly on what is actually going on here. And so uh, getting back to the you know, sit and listen and, and learn. And again, that just takes a lot of time. <laughs> So um, in terms of what, you know, what might be necessary for successful um, collaboration and interdisciplinary work, um, I think certainly respect for one another, f you know, of, you know, social science scientists for natural science scientists and, and vice versa. Um, I think also, you know, um, really integrating in a, a very deep way, so definitely, certainly time consuming, the, the um, knowledge and the tools of, of social science scientists and, and physical scientists. And I've actually had the opportunity to be part of, you know, coupled natural systems um, proposal writing, and it, it's, been, it's been challenging, you know? And I think 
there's that that sort of mutual respect is not not always not always apparent. Um, I mean, you know, because you know, we 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 recognize, and I think increasingly the reason that we have this sort of coupled natural system, uh, natural uh, social systems, human systems, uh, pro uh, grants and proposals and, and funding, is the recognition that the social, the the political are also really important, and and. I mean, just based on my own experience, I've found that in sort of f some some of the framings, you know, sort of by by leading with the the social science as in terms of the frameworks, and then bringing the skill of I, whether it be mapping or natural science science sciences, um, you know, the ecology, the economics, like really bringing these quantitative tools to bear. Um, also, sort of thinking about the the um, indigenous and and local knowledges, but but by sort of framing it within the social and political economic, there are some really inter I think there's some really interesting um, outcomes that can that where both both are quite powerfully employed in the research, um, but the framing sort of starts with the with the social sciences. Well, I, I completely agree with the amount of time. I think we probably all at this table and many of us in the room have been asked to be sort of the token social scientist on one of these grants and then we come to the room and say, here's $100,000, you do something with the word social in it. And uh, <laughs> that's sometimes exciting for the money, but it's, it, it doesn't lead to true interdisciplinary work. Um, so given that I agree, let me toss something new out there, tenure. Um, if it's the disciplines that are, are sort of the first pass of tenure, if, oh, I stole yours. You'll have to come up with a new one. <laughs> um, if it's my home discipline that, that is the first vote on my tenure case, what I often recommend for junior faculty that maybe have a coupled human nature system or have a National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences but are a social scientist, they need an extra external letter saying, this is actually a good thing uh, that people value this in the world. And so it almost becomes sort of as an excuse. You sort of need extra support to validate your investment in interdisciplinary work. Uh, and that's not fair to tenure candidates. It's the default then becomes stay within your discipline. So how do we fix that? You know, is it a Michael Crow-esque, let's erode the disciplines? I don't necessarily agree. Um, could there be intervention on sort of colleges and, and universities uh, to sort of diversify how that tenure process proceeds such that these things uh, get that higher valuation and don't require a little extra asterisk that says this in fact should count? That's okay. So then since he said in, you know, beautiful big terms uh, what I was going to say, then I'll just share my personal um, story about my project that I presented today. Um, I became, I had, you know, I was aware of NEPA before I got here, but one of the first people that I met when I came to campus as a, a first year assistant professor was Mark Miller, who's now Dean of Law. Um, and he was the one who told me that there's this dearth of sort of um, quantifiable data. There's all sorts of NEPA documents, but they're not in a repository. You have to do data mining to figure out what the data really is. Um, and I had to put that on hold, even in a university like this, I had to put that interest on hold until I got tenure. Um, I mean, for the last 10 years, it's gotten better, but you get a call, it's like, we need an economist for this grant. And it's like, well, no, you don't need the economist. NSF requires it. And it's like, can we? Can you just give me your vita, you know, in two days? And literally, we're an afterthought. I think another thing is that the way it's set up kind of pits the different social sciences against each other. So it's like, okay, we need a social scientist as a token, which means it's going to be an economist, or it's going to be a sociologist, or it's going to be a geographer, instead of having joint things. I think a heartening thing is like I'm, I'm on a project now looking at uh, dealing with herbicide resistance and there there are like two rural sociologists and three economists on this project along with agronomists and other folks and it's it's been great because one of the things I've gotten from from sociologists is that technology adoption the way economists think about it it's like here's an individual farmer maximizing profit all on his own Whereas the sociologists are looking at it, here's this whole social network in terms of how people make decisions about their technology, and it's a way that I've never thought about it. But if you're the only social scientist working with physical scientists, you don't benefit from the insight of other social scientists. 
Um, so it would be nice if when they say interdisciplinary, there isn't just a single social science box to check that you know that you look for 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 you know to actually have things where we can work together. Well, at least there is a box. But anyway, <laughs> um, okay. Well, I'd like to thank these brilliant people who performed so well and uh, answered such difficult questions. You all did just fabulously. Um, could you all give them a hand of applause? <laughs> And, uh, and thanks to all of you for caring about this, because actually I think this, these are central issues in what all of us are doing here in academia. Um, so really pleased to see what a great turnout it was. Um, and make sure you come to whatever our next event is, which I have no idea what it is. Not till September, I guess. Yeah, we had three this week, and then you get a break. Um, anyway, thanks very much to all of you, and thanks to the audience. And Mary. <laughs>